the Word of God. After being able to sit and listen to a great lesson last hour, I, I really wish that as the circumstances are that we could have fulfilled the original plans and been here for several days and been a part of this, but as things go, I'll be going back home later this afternoon, but I do cherish the time this morning and appreciate the opportunity again from the elders and the congregation here to be able to be a part of this lectureship. I would say that of the two questions that I was assigned to answer, uh, the former one is a little bit more difficult in preparing, but the latter, uh, this hour's, is a little bit difficult from the standpoint of you don't want to mess up what Jesus taught so simply. Uh, so it's just a straightforward teaching from Jesus, but a question again that we need to be able to answer, and hopefully we'll be able to see that uh, once again from the scriptures. We all probably, in general, like the idea of blessings and rewards. It's been several weeks, maybe a month or two ago now, that I offered a, a blessing, so to speak, uh, to one of my children. Uh, we do have chores that they have to do and, and responsibilities, but sometimes there might be extra opportunities, and this was the occasion that I offered $20 if one of my children would mow the two acres behind the house there. And so I thought that was reasonable for the age of the child and the fact that it was a riding mower, and 20 bucks would be a lot of money back in my day. It might not be today, but that was the offer. Uh, so the child declined said offer, not with Ill, any ill will towards me or any, you know, disagreements or, you know, lack of respect. It wasn't anything like that. This was an optional offer and the reward was there. But the reward is never gained because the acreage was never mowed. The two acres never got mowed and so the $20 was never given. But I think about that just in general. Uh, there's no fault on my child for choosing not to do that. But the idea that many like blessings, many like the idea of rewards, but so many times nobody wants to do anything for those blessings. Nobody wants to have to do anything for those rewards. They like the idea, even as we might go into now a spiritual sense of the blessings that Jesus Christ has to offer. So many like the idea of a home in heaven and a mansion prepared for us, but how many are willing to do anything and in this case, it would be required of God to do something that he has spoken by command to be able to obtain that reward in heaven as it has been offered. Many like the idea of reward and a blessing, but don't want to have to do anything for it. So we might think about the great spiritual blessings that are offered in Jesus Christ. Uh, the living water of John 6, or the, of John 4, the bread of life of John chapter 6. Uh, the great spiritual blessings, eternal life itself, but Jesus would say in familiar passages, John 14, 15, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. It's not an extension of the living water and the bread of life to all, regardless of whether you do anything or not. It's a requirement of having to obey. Jesus offers eternal salvation, Hebrews 5, 9, to all who what? To obey him. So there is a responsibility of man in order to obtain the blessings that Jesus is ready to willingly offer to all who would come and who would obey him according to the scriptures. That brings us to our question as is stated in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Here in this Sermon on the Mount as recorded by Luke, Jesus asked this question. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? What a simple question. What a profound question. At the same time, one in which, again, we need to be able to find an answer from the Scriptures. Uh, those here profess Jesus to be their master, their ruler. That's what they say there in those statements, Lord, Lord. That's what that means. Jesus, you're my master, I serve you. But at the same time, they were inconsistent. Their words said one thing, but their actions said another. As recorded also in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, these wanted to enter in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, Again, you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't will, do the will of my Father in heaven. They want to go to heaven. They want that reward, that blessing that is offered by God through Jesus Christ, but they don't want to do anything for it. And so they simply call him master, but their actions are inconsistent with their words. And as long as no action is taken, no reward will be given. How many people in this world would say of Jesus, you're my Lord? You're my Savior, you're my Master, you're the ruler of my life, but do nothing in connection with the Scriptures that would demonstrate obedience. And maybe we might say, well, it's not a matter of doing nothing, maybe they even do some things. But partial obedience is not faithfulness unto God. 
we better consider the fact that as Jesus asked this question, how many today would still fall into that category of simply calling Jesus Lord, but not actually serving Jesus as their master? Now also, Matthew's account of this same sermon of Jesus would take it a little step farther. You know, Matthew actually gives us a few more details of this sermon than Luke records here. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and following, you have those again who would say, God, or speaking to Jesus, and of course He is deity, He is God, didn't we do many great things in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? We did many wonders in your name? And Jesus would say to those, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, or those who practice lawlessness. You mean not just those who, who say, Lord, Lord, but don't obey, but those who actually do many good wonders, even in the name of Jesus, Jesus will say, depart from me? Why? Because they offer nothing more than lip service. A lot of people that also fit that category as described by Matthew in addition to what we find here in Luke. Not just those who would profess the name of Jesus and not obey, but those who would do many good deeds and maybe very sincerely in their lives, but still not do the will of the Father. Is there some sort of level that you could reach and say, well, I've done enough good deeds that now I will be saved? Well, I did all these things in Jesus' name. I, I did all these wonderful acts of benevolence, etc., etc. If we don't do the will of the Father, we still won't enter in that reward. The blessings that God has provided through Jesus Christ, the eternal reward that is offered unto all mankind, can only be received if we do more than just call Him Lord with our words can only be received if we do more than just pay lip service by our good deeds. We actually have to follow Jesus. Now here's the simplicity of what Jesus teaches in trying to get us to understand this basic lesson. That if we want the blessings, if we want the rewards that Jesus Christ has to offer, we want a better life, and that's what a life of following Jesus is. It's a better life. It's better than anything you could ever have in this world of physical things, how many would say, well, yes, I want this life. I want the blessings of Jesus Christ. I want those blessings here and now, and I want them in that home in heaven. Nobody understanding much of anything about the Scripture would deny that. It, well, I don't want those things. I mean, that would be absurd. If anyone knew anything about the Scripture, you want the blessings of Jesus. You want that home in heaven. Okay, Jesus, how can we understand this question? Well, as we continue to find there in Luke chapter 6, he gives a simple parable. Uh, what I learned very early on as a child as to what a parable was, was an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. I've never professed to be a real complicated man. You can ask my wife, maybe she can clarify one way or the other, but like most, I put my pants on one leg at a time. You know, I don't profess to have some great you know, degree in philosophy or be able to uh, rattle off some great understanding in, in the, you know, the subjects of this world. Nothing wrong with education. That's my degree. I'm just a simple person. I get simple lessons. And Jesus gives a simple lesson about two builders. And what distinguishes these two builders helps us to understand the question that Jesus asks and therefore answers by this illustration in verses 47 following. So read with me the parable that Jesus gives after asking this question. He says, Whoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He's like a man which built a house and dig deep. And he laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently. And immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. I don't know if there's a kid among us who hasn't learned this in song form. I know we have a few out there. And even in vacation Bible schools and ages gone by. You know, eventually in my life I can now speak of ages. You know, I teach kids that are, you know, 20, 30 years younger than me. That's a little different for me to kind of swallow. I did have a statement made by a student just a while back. When you were a kid, that's when I finally started to realize I'm not in that young generation any longer. I've lost enough hair. My beard has turned color. You ever wonder if pirates' names change from black beard to gray beard? I think that's where I'm getting pretty close to. You know, I realize that things have changed in life. But even as a little kid, I can remember way back when singing, the wise man built his house on what? On the rock. 
And the foolish man built his house on the sand, and the rains came down, and the house on the rock stood firm because it was built on that rock, but the house built on the sand went splash. I mean, what kid doesn't love singing that song? But the teaching is what Jesus taught here. It's what's recorded in Luke 6 and Matthew 7. And though it is a simple lesson, again, it is so profound in understanding. If we want the blessings, think about what Jesus teaches here. It's more than saying, Lord, Lord. So what does it require of us to receive those blessings of Christ? First thing we find here is that the blessings of Christ is better life requires hearing. Here in Luke 6, as we look at this, uh, Jesus says, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings. Well, the sayings of Jesus in Matthew 7, 24, whoever hears these sayings of mine. Think about what Jesus has just delivered here. It's that great Sermon on the Mount. These sayings specifically are what he just got through teaching, although it's much greater than that. But think about what Jesus taught of here in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 26. Possess those beatitudes. As you continue, verses 27 through 35, love your enemies. Verse 36, be merciful. Don't judge and condemn the way that men do according to man's standard, but rather forgive. Verse 37, give. My favorite verses of this chapter is the idea of if you give, it will be given to you overflowing. Jesus taught that here. Verses 39 through 42, fix yourselves. Get right with God before you try to help someone else with their problems. Verses 43 through 45, bear good fruit and not bad fruit. Jesus said, whoever hears these sayings of mine, immediately he's talking about the sermon that he's just preached here in this chapter. Now again, Matthew records more details, so consider the, the greater detail that Matthew gives in chapters 5 through 7. There Jesus taught to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth, chapter 5, 13 through 16. Jesus commanded us to, to do and to teach what he had given, not what men had given. If we want to be great, we've got to follow his commands. Matthew chapter 5, verses 20 through 26, don't be angry and don't murder. Uh, there to follow, Jesus would say, don't lust, don't commit adultery, verses 27 through 30. Verses 31 and 32 of Matthew 5, do not divorce unscripturally. Jesus would say, let your yes be yes and your no be no, verses 33 through 37. Just be people of your word. You ever get frustrated dealing with people that just won't answer a question? And they could promise you the world, and you know they're never going to fulfill it. Jesus said, just say what you intend to say and be done with it. Just say yes and no. That's what he taught in Matthew 5. Go the second mile, verses 38 through 42. You enter into chapter 6, and we're supposed to do good not to please men, but to please God. You continue there in that same chapter, and we're taught about how to pray properly, verses 5 through 15. We're again told to not act to be seen by men, and then we're told to lay up our treasures in heaven, verses 19 through 21. Don't trust in the things of this world. Put your riches where they should be. Put your treasures in heaven where they should belong. Jesus continues to teach, and he brings it to the, the forefront of our minds that we should seek and serve God first. Choose your master, verse 24 and 33. Trust in God's providential care, verses 25 through 33 of Matthew 6. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Matthew 7, 12. Walk the narrow pathway. Stay away from that broad path that leads to destruction. Verses 13 and 14 of chapter 7. Do not bear bad fruit like false teachers. Verses 15 through 20. Whoever hears these sayings of mine. Jesus is saying, listen to my teachings. You ever say that as a parent to a child? Are you listening? I've actually said things before, and I won't call my children by name. I know you're not supposed to use them as examples, but I'm a parent, so here are all these examples every day. But I reflect, and I know I was the same way as a child on many occasions. I've told people before, I often just think about calling my parents and saying I'm sorry. Just, just for the whole lot of everything I did, you know, I'm sorry. Because I know what I put them through. So I have experienced that now with my own, and I, I know I've said things, and they've been in the same room may even looked at me in the eye, and I've said something to them, and, and I'll come back later. Why haven't you done what I've said yet? What'd you say? Are you listening? I mean, is there somebody inside? Is there something between those ears or just a cricket playing racquetball? I mean, hello, are you there? Now, I don't say all that to get off track, but the point is, are you listening to what Jesus is saying? We might hear the sermons, we might read the words, but it's simple from this standpoint. Jesus is saying, open your ears. 
Hear what I am saying. Listen to the teachings that I've just delivered. And it's more than just a Sermon on the Mount. It would include everything he taught. Now, Jesus, when he gave that great commission, Matthew 28, sent his disciples out to teach them to observe all things that he had commanded. Everything that comes from God would be included within the teachings that Jesus has given or subsequently authorized through his apostles and inspired writers. We need to be listening to the word of God. From where does our faith come? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yeah, it seems simple. Listen to what Jesus says. Listen to the words of his inspired apostles. Listen to the Bible that has been given to us. You want to make it to this place of blessing? You know, I'm thankful that we have technology because you can put directions into your phone and your phone will tell you how to get from point A to point B. I've been here before, but I knew when I hit traffic close to rush hour this morning, I wasn't going to be able to, to use my phone and figure out the roads on the map. So I don't like to do this, but I actually hit the button that says start and it will tell you where to turn. So then all I had to worry about is just keeping in fourth gear so I could actually get up to speed on the highway. That was my greatest concern amid the traffic. How do I get from my home to this place? Well, Google Maps will tell you. How do I get from this place that is not this location here in, at 39th Street, but how do I get from this world, this physical earth, to my heavenly home? I need to listen to the sayings of Jesus. I need to listen to God's Word. I need to hear what the map says that gives me directions that takes me to that heavenly home. Psalm 119, 105, God's Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Google Maps will not get you to heaven. I guarantee you, though they have about everything, that's not in their service. We need to be listening to the words of Jesus Christ, again, to appeal to the context of what we find also in Matthew 7, is that narrow pathway. In the same sermon in which Jesus says, if you call me Lord and don't hear the things that I'm saying to you and subsequently do them, you're not one of my followers. But it starts with hearing. How many people want the blessings that Jesus has to offer but are unwilling to listen to what he has to say? So are you studying your Bible on a regular basis? I know that many of you are. Uh, you're here this morning to, again, hear the Word of God proclaims. But are you doing that daily? Are you listening to the proclamation of that Word frequently? Uh, technology, though it can be used for evil, can also be used for great good. How many sermons are available online from faithful preachers, and faithful congregations, and podcasts? And We've got brethren here that are engaged in that so much more so than I could ever imagine. And they are spreading the Word of God. But are you taking opportunity to listen to it? Now, I realize there's not enough hours in the day to listen to every single sermon from every single preacher you know of. You'd have a Sunday and a week long of that, but are you taking advantage of when you do have those opportunities to listen to the Word of God proclaimed? Are you partaking of those blessings found in Christ and, and looking to that better life that He has to offer by taking this first step of hearing? But it's more, of course, you know, than just hearing. What else would be required for us to have these blessings of Jesus Christ. Well, again, we go back to Luke chapter 6. In verse 47, Jesus says, Whoever cometh to me and heareth my words and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. Doing here is taking the knowledge that we gain from hearing and applying it. And there's a word that's used even in this parable here that really fits what Jesus is talking about. This is wisdom. Knowledge is simply the acquisition of facts, and that's what we would gain through hearing, through our study, through our listening to the proclamation of God's Word. But Jesus says it takes more than knowledge to partake of these blessings. You've got to take that knowledge and do something with it. You've got to take that knowledge and act upon it. That's the doing part that Jesus is talking about here in this parable. If you hear and you do, then you are wise. You say, well, man, this isn't rocket science. I get this, yeah. But there's profound understanding because you see both sides of this not only play out in the Scripture, but in our world today. Think about those examples who heard the Word, but they did nothing. And then also think about those examples of people who did hear that Word and did something. There's a stark contrast between the two. Think first about those who heard and then did. What about Acts chapter 2? We know what happens there. 
Peter and the other apostles stand up and deliver that first recorded gospel sermon, and he told them what they needed to do. Repent and let every one of you be baptized for the remission of your sins. They heard that, right? But 3,000 didn't just stop with a hearing. Verse 41, they obeyed that gospel. They were immersed into Jesus Christ and to his kingdom. They were immersed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They did obey. And subsequently, their sins were washed away. And God added them to His church, the body of the saved. They heard and they did. A few chapters later in Acts chapter 8, what about the eunuch? Here he is taught the gospel, and he responded. Are there those today who will also hear and respond? Yes. And thankfully, we can think about those great examples in our own lives, of people who just didn't stop with hearing, but demonstrated their faith by taking action. Uh, we can look at the definition of faith, and you know it well in Hebrews. Uh, we find there in chapter 11 that by faith, these individuals what? They did things. They acted. They obeyed what God commanded them to do. James 2 would describe for us true faith versus a faith that is fake and is based upon action. It's not just a belief, a mere mental assent that, yes, there is a God. No, it's more than that. It's taking action to do what God has commanded. Those who hear and do are wise. Uh, Paul, when he writes to the brethren in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he talks about how for some, preaching is foolishness. I mean, I'm sure there are some today who would look at us sitting here and coming to a, an event like this and say, well, why are you wasting your time? You took off work and you wasted your vacation to come and listen to preaching? After that lesson that I was able to sit and listen to, it, it really almost saddens me that I'm not going to be able to be here for the rest of the time. I love preaching, but I love listening to it as well. I love the Word of God. But some look at that and say, well, this is just a, a foolish waste of time because they don't understand that the blessings of Christ and this better life that He has to offer only come as a result of hearing and doing what God has commanded through the proclamation of His Word. And some to them is foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, it's not foolishness. Because what do we know? We know that we have heard the truth. We know that we have obeyed the truth. The message of God is not foolishness to us. The message of God is that which brought us the understanding of what we have to do to be saved. And it brought unto us salvation when we obeyed it. We heard and we did. And we now experience the blessings of Jesus Christ and the better life that He has to offer. What about the other side? Well, there in Luke chapter 6 and verse 49, Jesus says in this parable, He that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation. So you also have those who hear, but they don't take action. Meaning they're not wise because they have the knowledge, but they don't do anything with that knowledge. They don't subsequently follow in line with what God has commanded. They just go about their days living according to their own standards. Or they go about their days in rejection to God's standard. Whatever the case is, they're not in line with what God has taught. They have heard, but they do not do. Again, the parallel in Matthew 7, 26, whoever does not do them, Jesus saying, my sayings, whoever doesn't do what I say. Are there examples in the scripture? How sad it is that not only can you find these great examples of people who heard and did, who heard and obeyed, you also find the others, right? In Acts chapter 24 and verse 25, Felix. Did he hear? Did he hear? Did he heard? I won't tell you that. I taught English in the past. Uh, did he hear the teachings of the gospel? I told you I was a common person. That comes out sometimes, by the way. Despite I know the rules of grammar, I still don't always use them. When Felix heard the teaching of the gospel and he was reasoned with concerning self-control and, and the judgment to come, what was the difference between Felix and the 3,000 in Acts 2? What was the difference between this man and what you find in the eunuch in Acts chapter 8? He heard, but he did not do. He didn't act. He didn't obey the word of God. What about those in Athens backing up to Acts chapter 17? And Paul stands there, and of course the Greeks just love to hear somebody proclaim whatever it was they were proclaiming. But Paul preached to them the fact that they worshipped every god, but they didn't know the true and living God. But what you see as a result of his preaching is not a mass conversion. There were a few, but most heard and did not obey the gospel. Is that not still the case today? How many people have heard the word of God proclaimed, but never obeyed it? How many people have maybe even sat in pews because 
they were wives or children or friends that were invited to worship, and they heard the, the gospel invitation given. They know the truth. They heard it, but they never obeyed it. I know it breaks my heart to think of my loved ones. I know it breaks my heart to think of even ones who have, who have passed, who have died and never obeyed the gospel. But the opportunity is in this life, not in the life to come. Here is the time right now in this life, while you have breath in your lungs, to be wise. It's more than just knowledge. It reminds me of Solomon. Solomon had more knowledge on all the subjects of this earth than anyone probably has ever possessed. In Ecclesiastes, he states that he tried everything under the sun. You know, I have a little bit of that in my mind sometimes of, well, I'd like to know about this. I'd like to know about, you know, this subject and that subject. And I get into things sometimes, and sometimes you go down that pathway so far, you think, I, I don't really need to know any more about this. Uh, we started uh, raising some chickens for eggs. Now, if you ever think that you're going to come out ahead on that, I just assure you that's not the case, but... You know where they come from, and I guess it's kind of a hobby. They become almost pets in a sense. But when they get sick, then you're trying to research, well, what's going on, and why is this chicken sick, and what do I need to do to try to get this chicken well? And you can't take it to the vet because it'd be a whole lot cheaper just to buy a new one than to try to fix the one that's sick. So I've done a lot of research on chickens. Not a single ounce of that information has got to get me any closer to God. I know a few things just because I tried to learn a few things. And there's a lot of subjects in the world that we could study until the day we die, and they won't bring us one step closer to God. It's not about hearing the wisdom of the world. It's not about knowing all the knowledge on this earth that is available, but it is about knowing God's Word. And when we know God's Word, it's more than just knowing that Word. If we want to be wise, we have to take action and do something with what we have learned. Those who hear and do are wise. Those who hear and do not are foolish. Well, do you want to be wise? Or do you want to be foolish in the eyes of God? To receive the blessings of Christ, to partake of the better life that He has to offer, ultimately that eternal life, you have to hear and do. We come back to this parable, though, as we understand the hearing and the doing aspects of what Jesus has talked about, and think about that again in relationship to these blessings that are offered by Jesus. The foolish do not have the blessings of the better life in Christ. Verse 49, once again, it says, He that heareth and doeth not, is like a man that without a foundation builds an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Well, he's giving us an understanding. You know, if you hear and you don't act, you're like this man. You're like the man who heard the word of God but didn't do anything with it. You didn't take action. The foolish have built their houses without a foundation. And as recorded in Matthew, it says it's as if the one has built his house on sand. Well, sand is no better than having no foundation at all. I watched a, an episode recently of this construction company that built houses in this area where uh, there wasn't this you know, solid bedrock type place where you would have a sure foundation to construct upon. Rather, it was a sandy place. And they actually took what looked to me to be like telephone poles and they made a hole with water momentarily to be able to drive those poles as far as they could and then hydraulically pounded them down until there was nothing but just a, a couple feet left above. And you've got all this pole down below. And what this show showed was that they would put hundreds of these in place before they built on top of that. Now, I think I just built in a different location, but I learned something from that that is demonstrated by Jesus here in this parable. You cannot build and have a structure that will stand if you do not have a solid foundation. The foolish do not have that solid foundation. Their house is built on laziness and procrastination and shortcuts. They don't take action and therefore they do not have a solid foundation. There is no promise of salvation for them because they have built on something that is not Jesus. He's the only way. He's the rock. Blessings will not come because they are not built on Jesus Christ. The foolish cannot withstand the trials of life. Now here in Luke 6, 49, it says, The stream beat vehemently against that house. You ever been to a place that's been recently flooded and seen the gully washed out? Or seen a place you used to stand just washed away because the power of that water just swept away trees and rocks and everything? Here, this house is beat upon by that stream. 
And Matthew says, Matthew 7, 29, the rains, the floods, the wind beat on that house. Now what happened to this house? This one spiritual house that was not built on this solid foundation, what was the outcome? The house fell. Matthew records the very same thing here in Luke 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? It's like a, it's like a foolish man who builds his house without a foundation. That brings ruin, not reward. That brings eternal consequence of hell, not a mansion in heaven. And yet, here is the lesson. Hear and do what I say, and you'll be blessed. And yet some will hear and will not do, and the end result will be the ruin of their lives spiritually. What about the other side, the wise? Here in Luke 6, verse 48, he is like a wise man who built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. What's the difference? It's not just... Uh, the idea that Jesus is talking about builders, construction projects, the answer is the comparison between these two men and what differs in them in relationship to this question. You are foolish if you hear and do not do. You are a wise builder if you hear and you take action. And you build your house on the rock. Uh, the rock is Jesus Christ. You know the confession of Peter in Matthew 16 where he said Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 would also identify Jesus as that rock, that bedrock, a solid foundation. There is no shakiness. There is no give way. There is no fault in this foundation. We could probably take a poll, and I'm sure most of us could say, well, there's a crack in my house somewhere, in the foundation, in the wall, because when our houses are built, eventually that ground will settle it's to some degree, and that house will shift and move, and there will be cracks because that foundation is always going to have some sort of faults. But not so with Jesus. Jesus is a rock-solid foundation. There is no fault in Him. There is no shortcoming. There is no place where you say, well, Jesus, my life would have been better if your foundation would have been a little bit, uh, little, been a little bit better. Jesus is that rock-solid foundation. But the trials are still going to come. There is no other foundation, so we better make sure we're built upon this one, Acts 4, verses 11 and 12. But as those trials come, Luke 6, 48, the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently. And in Matthew's account, it says the rains and the floods and the wind beat on that house. But this storm, these trials of life could not shake this house. Why? Because it was founded on the rock. If our houses, spiritually speaking, are built upon this firm foundation, then we can put great trust and confidence that we will be able to withstand the storms and trials of this life. Sometimes by cliche, we say when it rains, it pours. Uh, you may know those weeks in your life or those months in your life when everything just doesn't seem to be working out quite right and you say, man, I wish things would get back to normal. That's probably a sentiment for the last six months, right, or plus. We know those times in life where we just think, man, things just are not working out. Those are the storms, those are the trials, and those things may not be caused by Satan directly, but he's going to use those as opportunities for you to doubt, for you to question your foundation, for to try to get you to move off of that. He's going to try to use the things of this world against you, and no doubt he's doing that even in the present trials that we all face. But when we stand upon the rock-solid foundation of Jesus Christ, our house will not fall. If it's not built on Jesus, it leads to ruin. But if it's built upon Christ, it brings reward. God is faithful, and God is just, and He will bless and reward those who hear and do. Now, the child I mentioned at the beginning never received the reward in an optional matter. That child heard, but did not take action. Never got the 20 bucks. Probably the next time the field needs mowed, I'll put it out there again and see what happens, but we'll just see. But on this occasion, there is a blessing that we do have a choice to make whether we will receive that blessing, but the command is not optional. Uh, the command is not one where God says, well, if you'd like to do this, you can, but you know, you pick and choose how you really want to, to live in this world, and you'd be saved your own way. You, you figure it out yourselves and build your own foundation, and uh, you follow the dictates of your heart. You just do this your own way, and, and maybe you'll get to heaven. 
God doesn't give it like that. God gives it the way Jesus has given it here in this parable. You hear and you do what he has taught. You listen and you follow his instructions. You pattern your life and you live each day according to his commands. And God says as a promise, I will bless you and I will reward you. That's the key. For those who are not yet Christians, there's a great blessing that still awaits. Have your sins washed away as been talked about already today in our lessons, uh, to be able to, to rise, to walk a newness of life, to know that the old man has died and you've become a new creature, Romans 6. That's a great blessing to know that you've been saved. You're part of this kingdom now. And this kingdom here is that's going to go on to its reward in heaven someday. That's a great blessing. And if you're a Christian who has fallen away, well, there's a great promise that if you repent, God will forgive you. God is ready to bless those who are willing to obey to become Christians and those Christians who have fallen away and need to come back to Him, He is ready to bless. He is there ready to forgive those who have fallen away. I think also of the words of Hebrews chapter 4 and the difference between the wise and foolish builders, though expressed with different words, I think also is exemplified here in what we find in Hebrews chapter 4 beginning in verse 9. It says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that has entered into his rest, he also has seized from his own works as God did from him. Let us therefore labor to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. If we are diligent, then we are like that wise builder who continue to hear and act upon the words of Jesus. If we are slack, if we do not endure, if we shrink back in unbelief, then we are like the foolish who do not hear and do what God has commanded. Jesus, again, is the author of eternal salvation to all who will obey Him. The question is, are you hearing and doing what God has required? As we come again to these words to make sure we understand the question and the answer, Jesus once again said in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? If you want to be wise like this wise builder, then hear and do. But if you choose to not do according to the actions that God has specified through His Word, then you'll be like that foolish builder. Which builder are you today?